um, how advances in biomedicine uh, will transform the global economy and whether we're going to go into an economic collapse state or we're, whether we're going to see the unprecedented economic growth. Uh, and I've written a book about it, published by Paul Gray Macmillan. Uh, hopefully everyone will have uh, a copy at the end of the lecture. So, one thing I would like to uh, set straight before I start talking, and to ensure that we're all on the same wavelength, aging is bad. <laughs> <laughs> aging kills, and uh, aging leads to uh, debilitating uh, diseases, uh, and at the end, to death. So uh, currently, uh, in the current framework, in our current framework, in our current uh, uh, paradigm, uh, we do not see any way to really get out of this uh, death sentence. And aging kills. We also run a, uh, a group on, on Facebook called Aging Kills, where we post a lot of graphical information to show that aging is bad. Um, and currently, uh, if you look at lifespans. Uh, in the developed countries, they fall on approximately this paradigm. So you see growth, maturity, peak, and then you see continuous decline. And approximately, uh, th this is an approximate abstract chart. So don't pick up on me say, uh, saying that, okay, well, we, we see this trend and this trend in this country. It's an abstract chart showing the lifespan uh, of you and me and uh, your grandmothers, your grandfathers, uh, and your parents. Uh, we're um, Life expectancy in developed countries, uh, currently you see it around 80. Uh, in the US, maybe touching 80 right now. In Japan, it's already su surpassed uh, 85 um, for men and women combined. And uh, recently, uh, in the recent maybe half century, in the past half century, we see um, an increase in bad behavior and uh, environmental problems. So that probably decreases our lifespan a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, there are preventative measures that uh, are in place where we get more advanced diagnostics, we get more advanced uh, uh, prevention technologies, we've got more advanced treatments, uh, and that really uh, pushes us here, so in terms of performance with age. Uh, but again, those two trends collapse into something that we see on the general level. So uh, one of the most commonly asked questions that uh, I get is, okay, but we eat uh, unhealthy foods right now. We don't follow uh, the paleo diet anymore. Uh, we don't exercise enough. We smoke, there is so much pollution. Well, that's, overcom that's compensated by uh, advances in biomedical sciences so far, and we still see uh, life expectancies increasing. Uh, when pollution is not going to be a factor as much uh, in behavior, uh, biomedical advances are going to uh, outpace all that, and we're probably going to get to intervention. How many of you uh, know Aubrey de Grey? All right, so about maybe 40%. <laughs> so that's uh, probably one of the most famous uh, um, biogerontologists in the world, was the first one to uh, propose a comprehensive model for combating aging, which consists of uh, seven strands uh, that he's focusing on. But that model um, is a little bit far out. So it focuses on repairing the damage accumulated, uh, accumulated during aging. He's actually located here in the UK, in Cambridge. Um, and some of the people here will go to his conference next week. How many people are going to the SENS conference next week? So maybe. <laughs> Uh, six. Um, that's one of the best conferences on aging ever. Uh, happens every two years. I highly encourage you to attend it next week if you can. Uh, so basically, those strategies uh, for repairing uh, damage, they probably will uh, be able to maintain your performance uh, over the length of your time. Probably even boost it. So with human augmentation, but I'm not going to uh, go into that. Um, so that's a preview of your life, basically. Um, aging, in its current form, uh, the current paradigm of aging, is that you are probably going to develop an age-related disease after uh, or, or before reaching 70 with a very high certainty. So most of the people uh, after 70 develop arthritis, 
Uh, that's uh, a disease leading to uh, pain and loss of function. Uh, hypertension is the second one, uh, most uh, common uh, age related disease. Uh, then we get various heart conditions, cancer, diabetes, stroke. In the US, uh, about a quarter of the people die of cancer. Uh, about half of the people get cancer nowadays. So that's the statistic. Um, and it's a very age-related disease. It's, uh, increasing, uh, the levels are increasing with age significantly. Um, but basically, this is an interesting, uh, funny chart. We ran a contest for best caricature, which uh, depicts uh, various aging problems and uh, paradoxes uh, for a lot of artists um, in Eastern Europe. And this was one of the, uh, uh, one of the cartoons. So basically, the longest living humans today, they didn't really exercise, they didn't really follow uh, any specific diets. Uh, the uh, oldest known person who lived 222 years, John Clement, uh, she quit smoking sometime uh, way after reaching 100. Uh, and she was drinking for the rest of her life. So uh, no real, real healthy behavior. Uh, will uh, get you uh, uh, significantly past those milestones. Uh, so diet and exercise will not cure aging, it's going to be interventions. Uh, aging has a very significant genetic component, basically in terms of uh, how your genetics protect you against aging. And uh, some of us are built as Toyotas, and some of us are built as you know Russian Ladas. However you treat them, they are only born defective. Um, so aging varies from individual to individual, and we, we uh, age at very different rates. Uh, the paradigm is very s similar from individual to individual. Uh, and on the population level, uh, the trends uh, are all the same, but uh, on the individual level, um, some of us lose function faster, some of us lose function uh, at much slower rate. And right now, uh, in the US, you see a lot of people uh, past 65, past 70, uh, living very healthy, productive lives, uh, and not even thinking about quitting the labor force. Um, and they may be contributing to the economy at much, uh, uh, much uh, more significant rate than uh, uh, much younger peers. Uh, and uh, most of the anti-aging research is focused on age-related diseases. Uh, very uh, few research projects currently are uh, focused on prevention of uh, loss of function and uh, uh, rejuvenation, uh, essentially. So, but uh, loss of function is not the major reason why people retire nowadays. Uh, there is also factors, there are factors like psychologic aging, erosion of skills, traditions and culture, and peer pressure, external locks of control. Psychological aging uh, is a very interesting and controversial topic. Um, evolution, if you think about it, uh, really uh, designed us to come into this life, compete, reproduce, um, care for our young, uh, let them compete a little bit, uh, and then gracefully decline. So there is a program for development up until we reach a reproductive age and a little bit further, but afterward the, revolution, the evolution doesn't really need us. So we already completed our function, reproduced, took care of our young, and then we really need to gracefully decline. So uh, there is a program of development, but there is no program for sustaining us in the uh, uh, perfect uh, uh, form, so maintaining homeostasis uh, for a very long time. Um, but after uh, evolution no longer needs us, okay, so uh, physiological processes uh, decline, but there are several psychological process, processes, psychological processes that are triggered by various uh, events in our life, uh, like for example childbirth, uh, and by age. So we get happier uh, at the end of our life, and we get uh, much more uh, optimistic and content view on life when uh, we age. So most people, if you ask uh, anybody on the street to do a survey, about half of the people will not want to live longer, especially those people in the later years, uh, for one reason or another. 
but that's a sign of psychological aging. Uh, many people after childbirth, uh, they uh, um, change their behavior significantly. And also your view on, the, uh, on your personal lifespan, uh, the way you perceive uh, your longevity also has a big effect on your uh, psychology. And I'm going to be talking about that later. Erosion of skills, that's another uh, reason why people retire. Well, basically, uh, I, you feel, find it very hard to compete with younger individuals in the workplace. Um, uh, there is also no real mandatory education for the elderly, so uh, most of them just don't take any courses. They don't try to maintain their the skills. Uh, and they are outcompeted by young, the younger generations. So traditions and culture um, in the workplace, if some of your, well, if most of your buddies retire, you also want to retire. Uh, and they kind of uh, try to pinpoint uh, the traditional aspects and say, okay, well, you are not following uh, the crowd. Uh, you are out of our pack. And uh, they apply peer pressure. Uh, the good news uh, is that uh, many elderly maintain their cognitive abilities uh, for their whole lives. Uh, things like verbal ability and uh, uh, inductive reasoning, uh, they stay with you for uh, almost on the same level uh, for the length of your productive of, of your life, essentially. Um, after 88, it's very difficult to conduct those kind of studies uh, because there are very few people available. Uh, so things like uh, numeric ability, which goes down, which declines uh, the fastest, it's basically ability to compute. Well, nowadays you don't really need it, you've got a calculator. I mean, how many youngsters nowadays uh, know how to compute? They all use calculators. Um, or perceptual speed, that's when you kind of clap, and uh, the time it takes you to react to that, uh, that changes over, uh, over your lifespan. But also there are um, various computer tools to help you increase your reaction time. So, but basically, uh, your major contribution in the workplace comes from inductive re reasoning and uh, uh, verbal ability. So the ability to think and the ability to communicate. And that stays with you for uh, uh, your whole lifespan. Uh, that's good news. Also, um, uh, so, uh, well, this slide is a little bit disassociated with the previous slide. I'll uh, uh, quickly, well, I'll quickly show you another slide. This one. Um, getting older does not mean that you are going to get less innovative. Uh, recent studies show that uh, the average age of the breakthrough uh, increased over the past century. Uh, significantly, and right now it's very well way past 40. So if you think about Steve Jobs, for example, right, he didn't discover the iPhone when he was uh, uh, 20 years old. He did a few other good things at that age, uh, but really his uh, uh, major breakthroughs came uh, uh, closer to the end of his life. And uh, many innovators uh, that uh, are producing discoveries today are way past 40. So the general uh, thought that uh, uh, people stop innov innovating after 25 is completely wrong. So that is changing dramatically. Um, some of the costs of aging. Uh, we can have uh, a very lengthy discussion about the direct costs of aging. Uh, some, of them, some of the statistics are uh, uh, here. Oops. Uh, for the US, as direct uh, medical costs uh, for age-related diseases, uh, we're talking about $108 billion a year uh, for just coronary disease, uh, $53 billion for stroke. Uh, but a very large portion of the uh, age-related costs uh, lie outside healthcare and outside uh, um, welfare. It's uh, indirect costs. It's um, uh, the costs of lost productivity uh, shown here, and even uh, more is the um, indirect costs of uh, sandwich generations, so to speak. So if you have to take care of your uh, um, elderly parents and grandparents, 
and perhaps uh, your uncles uh, and uh, extended family, uh, as they age, uh, you are not as productive in the, uh, in the workplace. You don't have enough time to spend on work. You have to really treat them uh, and keep, take care of them. Um, that's also one of the causes for uh, many people to exit the labor force uh, also early um, or enter uh, the labor force late. Um, and the uh, uh, indirect costs of aging are much more significant than direct costs. So we can basically put it into trillions in, uh, in the U United States alone. In Japan, where uh, uh, people live significantly longer than the US on average, we already see uh, the costs of aging extending to um, the family relationships. So some of the older generations, they don't want to live as long and they are considering euthanasia just not to be the burden uh, on the children. Uh, and in some families where family traditions uh, usually fostered uh, bonding uh, and um, very close social interactions within the family, they are broken nowadays because the younger population uh, also doesn't want to take care of their uh, parents. Uh, so. Uh, at some point of time, family traditions uh, change as people get older and live longer. Um, some of the reasons for uh, uh, retirement come from the loss of function, so you lose function. And uh, some of the causes of the loss of function are listed here, so that's uh, kind of my view on why people lose function and retire uh, due to the phys physiological conditions. One of the uh, causes of uh, loss of function is the loss of motor neurons. Uh, many of you probably know what it is, but uh, if you look at the muscle tissue, uh, it's full of muscle cells, myocytes, but uh, uh, it all, it's, it's controlled by um, various small neurons that are embedded under that uh, um, muscle cell matrix. And uh, those neurons are called the motor uh, neurons. Uh, as we age, we lose those neurons, and even if uh, we maintain our muscle mass at the same level, uh, and we, we have a lot of muscle mass, due to the loss of motor neurons, uh, we perceive uh, a, any task of being much more complex and hard um, than in our younger years. So we uh, think that lifting something like that would uh, require more energy. Uh, we perceive that it's more heavy, that it's heavier, and that's why we also want to uh, exit the labor force, and that's something that uh, uh, causes the perceived loss of function. Then cognitive decline, I've uh, mentioned uh, uh, that briefly, but that uh, loss of uh, um, numeric ability and uh, uh, the decreased reaction time really takes a toll. So many people uh, perceive that they are um, slower uh, on the cognitive level, even though they may not be slower. Uh, also pain coming from arthritis, uh, mostly, uh, and from other diseases, uh, causes us to lose function and retire. Decline on immune functions. Uh, our immune system uh, starts failing after a certain age. Uh, many of you probably know about the loss of thymus. Uh, it's, a, um, it's an organ where uh, some of the immune system uh, assisted, uh, immune cells mature. Uh, most of you already, some of you already lost it. Um, the involution of thymus uh, starts uh, very uh, early in life, and uh, you basically get a scar tissue uh, where it's supposed to be uh, by the age of 45. Um, loss of vision, so our vision deteriorates, and uh, if it wasn't for glasses, for example, which is a very good invention uh, in, um, in human history, uh, we would be retiring even earlier. Loss of renal function, uh, obesity, metabolic diseases, so we actually uh, tend to accumulate more fat, and uh, I develop uh, metabolic diseases uh, with age, sarcopenia, loss of muscle, uh, after 35, you start losing muscle, regardless of whether you're male or uh, female, and uh, it's very difficult to maintain. Uh, you accumulate fat, you lose muscle. 
Uh, and also, you also lose bone. So, um, for ma for many reasons, uh, uh, in females, also hormonal changes uh, lead to loss of bone. Is there and any good news in this? <laughs> 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 well, uh, yes, the, I'm I'm going to be talking about that. It's yes. just uh, understanding why you age and why you lose function uh, is mm. also quite important. Don't you agree? Uh, it's basically. It's uh, I've just spoken to uh, one of you before starting a lecture, and uh, a person uh, believes that uh, uh, aging comes from um, oxidative stress, right? So oxidative stress is a major cause of aging. Uh, yes, it's a major component, but let's take, uh, uh, let's step to another level of abstraction and look at the causes of aging, right? And some, something that's in between, uh, something that basically leads to the loss of function. Um, well, loss of bone, mineralization, uh, and advanced, advanced glycation products, uh, and products. Uh, that's basically accumulation of various calcium-containing uh, molecules in connective tissue in the course of aging, and that's uh, something that happens uh, um, due to the loss of homeostasis uh, for many uh, reasons, but also it's spontaneous. So you've got uh, lengthy fibers of collagen where uh, uh, small calcium-containing uh, molecules uh, 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 fit. Uh, you've got a few of those calcium-containing molecules nearby, they react uh, for one reason or another, and you've got a small substrate uh, which transforms uh, into a crystal with time. And if you open up uh, a, an elderly person after 70, let's say, an operating uh, table, and you start uh, touching the aorta with a scalpel, you'll have the same feeling almost as you are touching the sandpaper. Uh, and if you touch it, uh, the haptic experience will be very similar to touching an eggshell. Uh, very different from uh, when you're touching uh, a young heart. Uh, and cardio dysfunction, another uh, reason for the loss of function. Um, the good news. <laughs> That's uh, the chart I've made for the history of humanity over the past 600 years, uh, drawing population over time, population over 65 over time, and various major advances in science and technology uh, over the course of the human history. So, uh, as you can see, over the past 60 years, uh, we've got so many events uh, in our um, history of science, that they uh, make everything else look pale. Um, they eclipse everything else uh, we've achieved so far, and most of those advances are not in the clinic yet. They are just reaching the clinic. Uh, also, the population, if you look at the population, it took us uh, 400 years for the population to double from half a billion to a billion. Then it took us 160 years for the population to double uh, from a billion to two billion, and suddenly, 60 years, and it uh, tripled uh, to uh, over 6 billion, well, 7 billion. Um, and most of the uh, biomedical advances uh, in the human history also happened over the past 60 years. Uh, some of them have not uh, reached the clinic yet. Uh, many of you uh, probably look at the progress in science by tracking the articles in PubMed or, uh, uh, well, tracking biomedical literature. Uh, and that has been only near exponent for the past 10 years. But what really provides fuel to uh, biomedical research is funding, is grant funding. And if you look at grant funding, it also increased exponentially even at a much steeper curve than uh, publications. And uh, it, considering it takes about uh, uh, 10 to uh, 12 years for uh, a discovery, uh, for, uh, for a dollar uh, to propagate into uh, preclinical uh, study, uh, you probably are not even aware of some of the biomedical breakthroughs that are happening in the lab uh, today. Uh, and also, the time it takes uh, for a dollar to pro propagate into a publication uh, is also several years. 
So we are probably going to see a much steeper increase in the number of scientific publications in the very near future. So what uh, we are trying to do right now is we are trying to track the longevity dividend coming from uh, a, uh, an investment in uh, biomedical research uh, on the government side and on the non-profit side. And we started this journey by looking at government grants, uh, which is probably the earliest time when the uh, biomedical idea gets published. So I'll talk a little bit about the paradigm, how uh, science moves in general, the pipeline. But basically, it all starts with a government grant. Uh, and there are lots and lots of resources currently disorganized uh, worldwide where you can find information about biomedical grant data. Um, then uh, uh, you move to publications. You see how uh, a dollar transforms into uh, a publication. And look at the uh, re return on investment in terms of the number of publications per dollar investment, uh, dollar invested. And uh, one of the central databases for that is Medline, uh, PubMed. Now, nowadays, you also have Google Scholar. Uh, and Microsoft has a very interesting system. Uh, for clinical trials, you can use uh, uh, clinicaltrials.gov. It has currently uh, 130 clinical trials uh, running and historic. And you can look at how a publication propagates into the clinical world, into the clinical trial. Uh, somebody publishes a paper, and you look at uh, how this paper propagates uh, into the clinical trial. And then it becomes uh, um, messy. It's very difficult to evaluate the ROI of a clinical trial. Uh, you can look at things like uh, revenue for a pharmaceutical company. You can look at clinical data, so uh, the improvement in clinical outcomes for a certain uh, disease. Impact on longevity, which is extremely difficult to evaluate today because most of the biomedical breakthroughs that uh, can be tracked to the grant funding have not yet impacted the longevity uh, so that we can track it. Because uh, in humans, it takes a long time to actually see the impact on longevity for any certain drug. Um, and then the impact on the economy. So we're trying to track that. Um, and we decided to look at, OK, well, what, what is the paradigm for the propagation of the uh, ideas into uh, things that, uh, um, that drive the economy, like patents, clinical trials, and publications? And the paradigm is uh, like this. So you can like, conceive and describe the idea in the uh, uh, general science uh, research paradigm. So you uh, conceive and describe an idea that can take you uh, a few minutes. So I have a policy of one idea per day. If I don't generate an idea, I don't eat dinner. <laughs> uh, uh, but that can take you a very uh, limited amount of time. Then you need to get funding to uh, prove that your idea works. And that can take you anywhere from, again, minutes if it's your own funding, uh, or years if you're applying for government funding. Uh, then you perform your experiments. Uh, that may take, uh, again, sometimes uh, a few days to decades. Then you need to publish uh, your results uh, and apply for patents. And that takes you, again, many, many years. So sometimes uh, I've got a publication in review right now for uh, one and a half years. And uh, there are many cycles, many iterations of uh, uh, peer review. And it's getting much more difficult to publish in uh, um, prestigious journals. So that also takes time. Then you perform preclinical trials. So you start getting your molecules or uh, uh, methods into mice. Oops, I'm sorry, just a second, something's wrong. Um, into mice, uh, once you get it into a mouse, uh, you need to show that there is some kind of efficacy and low toxicity. Once you've proven that, you get into clinical trials on humans. And most of the time you try to focus on uh, uh, very complex cases uh, where the person, person is already on bed, deathbed, uh, and, well, he has a choice either to die or try your drug. In this case, it's very easy to uh, get your uh, clinical trials on the fast track, so to speak. Um, that's also one of the reasons why many clinical trials fail, because uh, some of the drugs that are targeting those late-stage diseases will not be efficacious. Then you need to get into a clinical propagation. Imagine your drug already passed the clinical trials. Uh, think statins or uh, beta blockers. 
they reached the clinical trial, uh, they, uh, the end of clinical trial, they got onto the market, the pharmaceutical company started marketing those drugs, uh, but they can market it only to, uh, again, those very complex, difficult, late stage cases, uh, and that's a very small percentage of the market. Uh, the pharmaceutical company will immediately start to uh, try to get into um, milder cases and perform uh, longer and more massive studies and try to get this drug into prevention, but that will take many years, sometimes many decades. Uh, and it may never get into prevention. So for example, if aspirin uh, was to be discovered, let's say, uh, in the 80s, uh, and they would try to pass it through the clinical trials uh, using the modern paradigm of clinical trials, it would have never become a preventative over-the-counter drug. Uh, that's how strict it is and that's how difficult it is. So basically, our ballpark calculation is that it takes 40 plus years for a geroprotector drug to reach the market from the discovery phase. So again, for aspirin, if you think aspirin, uh, the drug has been on the market for over 100 years. And just uh, over the past two years, we saw papers uh, that uh, confirmed that uh, aspirin has anti-cancer properties, uh, anti-cancer preventative uh, properties. Uh, aspirin just recently, again maybe over the past uh, 15 years, um, started to be used uh, for prevention of cardiovascular diseases. It's basically a blood thinner uh, drug. It uh, uh, prevents blood from clotting uh, in very small doses. So it took us uh, a very long time uh, several decades to understand that it works differently in different doses. So the cardio aspirin, that what you, uh, that's what you see today uh, and hear about, it's a very small dose aspirin, it's 81 milligrams to 100 milligrams uh, uh, dose aspirin, uh, and that's a blood thinner. So to understand the root causes of um, and the fundamental basis of uh, biomedical discoveries and try to track them early and understand their propagation into the market, uh, we created a resource called the Aging Research Portfolio. Uh, currently, that's the largest uh, database for um, uh, biomedical grant data in the world. We track almost a trillion dollars in funding over 25 years. It took me five years to build this system um, with a very large multinational team, uh, and it costs a lot of money to maintain. Uh, so we basically it's called Aging Research Portfolio because uh, we try to look at the relevance of those biomedical funding projects uh, to aging research. So when we, uh, if you go into search here, you can search for any keyword and uh, uh, you will get a lot of projects that do not relate to aging. But if you start uh, looking at the categories and try drilling down, um, uh, you will see mostly projects that relate to aging. And for that, we use a um, uh, team of over 200 uh, independent volunteer editors who go and edit specific categories uh, in this um, uh, tree of uh, um, classes relating to aging uh, research. And they basically look at, uh, uh, they search for uh, the projects where they are expert and look at what projects relate to a specific area of aging research uh, that relates to their interests uh, and pinpoint uh, the projects that do relate. Uh, but there are lots and lots of projects in the system, so we decided to uh, automate this procedure and we use the expert training sets, so those uh, um, sets of projects that were uh, groomed by experts uh, as training sets for an algorithm, for a support vector machine algorithm, uh, which looks at this training set and then looks at the universe of projects and looks at what projects are very similar to this training set uh, and uh, automatically uh, categorizes uh, those projects that are similar uh, to the categories that relate to specific area of aging research. So that's how the system works. Currently, it's, uh, it has more than 360 categories relating to aging research, and the major two categories are natural sciences and social and behavioral sciences. Uh, why we did that is because, uh, well, aging research is a very multidisciplinary, multifactorial um, field. Uh, you've got a lot of people claiming that they are aging researchers, right? I am an aging researcher. 
I, and there are some people who just study dem demographics. So they just did a survey, let's say, on Okinawa or um, in some other ge geography or in Mediterranean area. Uh, they found that you know eating salmon increases your lifespan by whatever years, right? Maybe one or two years. Uh, and it's a, even not even clearly pinpointed to salmon. They're just saying it's a diet. Uh, it's not genetic. Um, and they publish a paper, they publish a book, and the book will have immortality in it just to be noteworthy and uh, uh, sell a little bit more copies, but they do not really contribute to aging research. Again, okay, well, eat more salmon for your whole life. You're going to get uh, gain two years. Uh, productive or not, we don't know. Uh, but over this 100 years, uh, let's say your lifespan, uh, there are going to be much more interesting, much more productive discoveries that are going to extend your life uh, much more significantly. So let's say a breakthrough in uh, stem cell research or organ engineering is probably going to extend your life by a decade, right? If you get a new heart at some age and a new kidney, uh, we see that the cognitive decline is much slower than uh, the decline in some of the other systems of your body. Uh, so replacing some of the parts plug and play with your own uh, organs will probably yield a much more longevity, a much more significant longevity dividend than uh, uh, a population study uh, showing that salmon, eating salmon uh, increases your lifespan. So we wanted to kind of uh, separate those scientists into a separate group. Um, we groom data from the National Institute of Health. Uh, that's the largest funding body in the world. Um, and I'll be giving you many factoids today. So that's an interesting factoid to remember. It spends uh, about $33 billion annually on biomedical research. Uh, about $26, $28 billion uh, in extra mural funds. That's something that they give away as grants. Uh, in the US, in, internationally, so it's kind of illuminating the world. Um, we've got data from the European Commission. Uh, it's a much smaller funding organization, but it's, uh, it's still funding uh, science. Uh, we're talking about billions a year. And then Canada and Australia, and we're currently working on getting China. Um, China is currently the largest uh, funding, uh, uh, it's the largest country in terms of biomedical uh, funding. They just recently announced a program uh, to spend $308 billion over five years on biomedical research alone. Uh, and China is already, uh, I think it's already surpassed US in terms of the biomedical publications uh, and very soon is going to surpass US in terms of the biomedical research citations. Um, in this system, we also can uh, uh, do some basic knowledge management. We can look at trends uh, by keywords. So you enter a few keywords uh, and look at biomedical uh, uh, grant data uh, for projects containing those keywords. And then we can look at who is who, so who got most money. Usually if you got you know, 10, $15 million uh, worth of government grants for uh, a specific field of research, you are probably expert in this area because uh, you are supervising very uh, capital intensive programs. So it's a very good way to find collaborators. But with this kind of fu funding, why didn't we cure aging yet? Well, because it's a very complex process, right? It's, uh, uh, you can target aging with several magic uh, kind of bullets, but currently people are approaching uh, aging from the disease perspective. They're trying to uh, cut those diseases as the head of the uh, heads of the hydra or head of a multi-headed dragon. Uh, and every time you cut a head, a new one pops up. So you really need to understand the fundamental root causes of aging uh, to be able to uh, fight it. We actually also developed a resource called the Funding Trends, which allows you, like Google Trends, uh, it allows you to track um, patterns in uh, biomedical research and compare uh, various uh, fields of research. So for example, if you key in, um, it's not visible very well here, it's arthritis, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, diabetes, stroke. Uh, you can see that cancer is being funded at a, a much higher rate than, for example, arthritis. Even though, uh, from the economic standpoint, uh, for a country like the US, probably if uh, they were to uh, put more money into arthritis and treat it, uh, uh, cure it earlier than cancer, 
uh, people would probably be able to work longer and draw less money uh, from the economy in terms of the social security and healthcare benefits. So you can see that just on our system over time, $70 billion were spent on cancer, just $4 billion were spent on arthritis. So that system allows you to uh, draw to this kind of uh, um, conclusions. Um, most of the research funding uh, is increasing for all areas of age-related diseases, but uh, most of those uh, research projects are clinical trials and uh, treatment-oriented research with no clear research goals. So nobody sets the goal for their research project uh, stating that they want to have a longer, healthy lifespan in the population. Everybody is just doing basic research is for research purposes, uh, clinical research is to uh, get the drug on the market. So there is no, there is no uh, centralized research program with a clear goal in mind. Uh, and that's a very big problem. Uh, but the advances in biomedicine uh, not only come from uh, the increase in research dollars. It's also uh, communications. Uh, over the past 10 years, we've seen uh, uh, a boost in communications between uh, scientists. So. Uh, Think about 30 years ago. If you were a scientist in China, you probably didn't even know what the scientists in the US are doing. You really need to be subscribed to a specific journal. Right now you go to PubMed and everything is freely available. You, can, you do not need to repeat the experiments to uh, design something new, something novel, something cutting edge. Uh, there is advances in computing, advances in material, and also just uh, population growth. We've seen the population uh, increase uh, well, threefold over the past uh, 60 years. Well, some of us are predisposed to being scientists. Uh, we really want to crave uh, to produce new things. And the uh, same is valid for China and India, where if a farmer starts earning you know, a few more dollars a month, uh, that farmer would want to uh, go to university and try to contribute to science and try a new venturous uh, um, profession. Uh, and you, that, that's why you see so many scientists from China and India uh, coming into the field and uh, contributing to uh, biomedicine and aging uh, research in general. So uh, right now we're sitting on a time bomb uh, in terms of the uh, research projects coming out of those emerging areas. Uh, one of the lowest hanging fruits uh, uh, in aging research is uh, regenerative medicine. And uh, regenerative medicine is not just stem cells. We're talking about uh, tissue engineering, we're talking about uh, organ engineering, um, and in vivo regeneration. And uh, in my opinion, the regenerative medicine went through several stages very similar to uh, the World Wide Web. It's like Web 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. Regenerative medicine also went through 1.0, uh, 2.0, 3.0, uh, where people started with the embryonic stem cells and uh, Fetal stem cells, uh, tried to get them into the clinic, failed, um, gave the whole industry negative reputation. But then we uh, started seeing uh, adult stem cells being used in the clinic, uh, mesenchymal stem cells, uh, adult stem cells, um, uh, transplanted from the patient to the patient. So basically it's an um, autologous transplantation where you take your own cell from one part of your body, transplant it into another part of your body, and somehow it works. Uh, so that's regenerative medicine 2.0 and 3.0, we've got to cellular reprogramming. We can now uh, take a fibroblast, we can take a skin cell uh, from your body, uh, reprogram it, and it will become an embryonic stem cell. And afterward, you can actually turn the cell into anything you like. So just recently, uh, there have been great advances in IVF technologies, and people uh, even create a sperm out of your own uh, adult cells and eggs out of your own adult cells, and even fertilize them. It was just a recent paper out of Japan this year showing that you don't even need the uh, sperm and the egg anymore. You can use any cell in your body to create new life. Um, so that's regenerative 3.0, or regenerative medicine 3.0, where you can actually create uh, uh, cells, uh, embryonic-like cells from your own uh, adult cells, and then create organs and tissues from those cells. If you're using aging portfolio, you can see that uh, um, there is a lot of funding for stem cell research and for regenerative medicine. Uh, that's from 2012, um, early 2012. 
Uh, more than uh, 14 billion dollars were spent on projects uh, containing stem cells in their research titles. Uh, there are lots and lots of uh, groups focusing on stem cell research. Uh, there are lots of companies and VCs focusing on uh, regenerative medicine. So we're probably going to see a revolution uh, of clinical procedures uh, in regenerative medicine that will extend our healthy lifespans. Um, again, aging is very complex. Uh, and it cannot be really stopped by regenerative medicine alone. Uh, you really need to look at the fundamental root cause. That's a graph. Uh, I'm not going to dig deep into it. Uh, it's just showing the complexity uh, of aging research and aging processes. A uh, graph made by a collaborator of mine, Alexei Moskalev. We're currently working with him on a system called the Aging Chart, which will be a graphical Wikipedia of aging. If you would like to get involved in this project, contact me. Um, where you would be able to uh, uh, look at one of the um, areas of aging uh, and aging research, click on it and you would get the pathway, 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 and the end you will get to the molecular and uh, um, cellular levels uh, of aging. Well, one of the first charts was created by John Ferber, uh, a very famous uh, biogerontologist who is also going to be speaking at the Sense 6 conference next week. Um, that's a roadmap which I created. Uh, sorry, it's not uh, appearing on the screen as good as on the computer, but basically it shows you the history of uh, biomedical discoveries transforming, uh, translating into, clinic, into the clinic. So basically, uh, I'll show you an example. Maybe it's, yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's very visible here. So for blood transfusions, uh, blood typing uh, was discovered uh, in uh, 1901. I, it took us seven years to see the first successful blood, you know, blood transfusions in human. Uh, then it took us uh, more than 30 years to get to blood banking. Uh, before we've, uh, uh, we saw advances in um, uh, cryogenics, no, not in cryogenics, in uh, uh, refrigeration, uh, and started looking at various ways to preserve cells. Uh, in this case, it's a 2% uh, sodium citrate solution. Uh, it was not possible to store and transfuse blood. Uh, and only after the 1940s, uh, that area uh, went mainstream, so after the war. So it really took a long time. And if you think about it, blood transfusions, which uh, is basically mainstream procedure at every hospital, even at uh, a local um, a private hospital, you will have uh, you have the ability to tr transfuse blood. And that's the earliest procedures in regenerative medicine. You can even store your own blood today uh, in a bank and then transfuse it to yourself later on. So we're also a very popular service. Um, but nowadays, so you need a few technologies to converge in order to get uh, uh, to the clinic. And also you need to have lengthy clinical validation and demand from the market in order for the biomedical discovery to get uh, uh, mainstream. And over the past uh, 20 years, we've seen many of those advances. We're talking about hundreds, and uh, many of them are converging. So, for example, hematopoietic stem cells were characterized in the uh, uh, mid-80s. Right now, again, at our pediatric cancer center, we are making all, uh, many, many, many hematopoietic stem cell transplantations. They are already saving lives. Um, in the very near future, we're probably going to see uh, therapeutically viable induced pluripotent stem cells. That's where you actually can reprogram your own adult cells uh, to become uh, embryonic-like uh, and use them for therapy. So uh, there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of technologies brewing at the uh, preclinical level and clinical level that you do not see and you do not, do, do not know. And one of those technologies is, for example, RNAi, uh, RNA interference. It's RNA silencing. Uh, it's a way to uh, inhibit certain genes um, in vivo, in the, in the cell. Um, and uh, it was, uh, the technology was discovered essentially uh, in mid-2000, uh, published 2006. Uh, Nobel Prize was awarded, um, uh, I think also like 2008. Um, so very rapid uh, transition from the discovery to, um, oh sorry, here's RNAi, that's why I don't see it. 
Um, so 2006, Nobel Prize was awarded, um, and the Technology of the Year award was 2002. Uh, Mid-2000s, that's where this uh, technology got uh, um, uh, into papers, mostly. Uh, for another technologies, IPSC, I've talked about that, cellular reprogramming, also a very rapid transition from the publication in 2008 uh, by um, uh, Yamanaka to the Nobel Prize in uh, 2012. Just last year it was uh, awarded. Actually, when I was writing this book, um, I had uh, a uh, paragraph stating that, uh, well, Yamanaka will definitely get a Nobel Prize. And that was uh, uh, in 2010 when I wrote that. It took us a long time to get this book published. Uh, and while it was uh, being still uh, in the editorial pro uh, phase, we had to change it to uh, the Nobel Prize got awarded to Yamanaka for this discovery. Uh, but those technologies, the impact of those technologies is immense. Uh, you will see those technologies, uh, both the IPSC uh, and the RNAi getting into the clinic uh, and uh, uh, extending lives, saving lives. Well, this technology basically allows you to manipulate uh, uh, genetics in vivo. You can uh, inhibit almost any gene uh, in your body uh, using various uh, delivery mechanisms. Um, <laughs> and we will get to an era of longer lifespans. So if you look at the, um, uh, at the life expectancy curves over the past century, uh, you can see that the life expectancy at birth at the, uh, in the 1900s uh, was very low. It was basically uh, um, like 47-ish, 46-ish. Um, if you got to the age 20, it was already pretty high, so it was about 62, 63. It's about the same as it is in Russia today at birth. Um, so we kind of deteriorated. That's, that's US data. Uh, if you were 75 um, in 1900s, you were still expected to live to, uh, um, uh, to, live to like 80. Um, and uh, it's still the case today. So that didn't change significantly, but that uh, changed dramatically. So we uh, managed to get the uh, life expectancy at birth by decreasing child mortality. Um, uh, basically, it, it doubled. Uh, here, it didn't uh, increase much. So basically, it's a 10-year incre increase to life expectancy. Uh, but in the future, this is probably going to be the major driver um, for uh, uh, longevity, for uh, life expectancy. We cannot really decrease uh, child mortality anymore. Uh, we will increase uh, life expectancy at age 75. Um, in the US, and this is uh, CDC statistics, Center for Disease Control, those are the um, uh, population distribution curves for 1900s, uh, 1900, uh, 1970, 2000 uh, and projected uh, 2030, 2030 projection. Uh, this are baby boomers uh, that move uh, um, over time through those population uh, diagrams. Uh, and we can see that very few people lived to uh, the retirement age in 1900s. Uh, in 2000, uh, already a very large percentage of the population uh, lived significantly beyond uh, the retirement age. And um, in 2030, a very large percentage of the population, again, these are CDC projections based on historic trends. They do not incorporate biomedical advances in their forecasts. Uh, a very large percentage will live beyond the retirement age and uh, apply a very significant toll um, on the economy. So that's where we start talking about economics. Um, in uh, the UK, uh, there are already first uh, warning signs by the IMF stating that if we do not uh, increase the retirement age right now, we are going to get into a pension fund bubble and uh, the national debt will spiral to 135% of the GDP by 2050. Those are very conservative uh, uh, estimates. And people are, that already got comfortable with the retirement paradigm are trying to 
resist this change. They do not understand that the um, uh, that the possibilities, uh, the future possibilities for life extension, if in the current paradigm, uh, could be uh, deadly to the economy. So if we do not increase the retirement age, uh, at least at the same pace uh, as uh, we see life expectancy increase, um, we are going to get into a major uh, financial problem, talking about the costs. So there is a very urgent need to increase the retirement age uh, ahead of the inevitable longevity gains. Uh, as I've mentioned, there is a lot of advances in biomedicine brewing at the preclinical and clinical level uh, that will progress uh, into the uh, um, clinic very soon uh, and extend uh, uh, our longevity. And most uh, of that longevity increases will come at later ages when we are already not contributing to the economy. Um, uh, so basically what we did, we also analyzed the uh, US economy from the uh, unfunded liabilities and from the uh, public debt perspective. So currently you probably have heard over the past two years, you could not, not have heard about this, the debates about the uh, uh, debt ceiling in the US, right? That's the public debt ceiling that they're debating uh, of increasing to uh, uh, way past the $16 trillion. But that $16 trillion, that's nothing compared to the liabilities the U.S. owes to, uh, the U.S. has to its own population in the form of social security and healthcare uh, benefits. So uh, there are very famous economists, uh, there is one out of Harvard, Lawrence Kotlikoff, uh, that recently published several papers uh, looking at the net present value of the unfunded liabilities of the United States uh, uh, by discounting uh, by discounting the social security and healthcare um, uh, using today's uh, assumptions for life expectancy, so basically 78 uh, years going forward, um, and he came to a figure uh, somewhere close to 300 trillion dollars for this. Uh, we recalculated uh, his. Um, uh, figures uh, using more conservative assumptions uh, and came to 44 trillion. So basically together with uh, uh, national debt, uh, we are going to be looking at about 60 trillion dollars in uh, uh, fiscal imbalance and unfunded uh, liabilities, well plus national debt. That's uh, a figure that the US would never be able to pay. Uh, we published a couple of papers, one of them is uh, in uh, Pensions uh, uh, International by Paul Gray. You can uh, take a look at it, it's openly accessible. Uh, we modeled a few scenarios for uh, uh, decreases in mortality in the United States due to various biomedical breakthroughs. Uh, and also demonstrated that um, uh, we're talking about currently uh, 30 to uh, 80 trillion dollars in unfunded uh, liabilities in net present value of uh, future fiscal deficits um, if some of the biomedical breakthroughs get to the uh, uh, clinic and uh, we do not see major increases in the retirement age. So if uh, uh, the retirement age uh, 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 is extended uh, using uh, the current schedule that the US government has for the next 30 years. Um, and we have uh, several scenarios for the economic development using those models. Uh, we can probably, we probably will see uh, a major uh, economic decline and possible economic collapse somewhere between today uh, to um, 2035. Um, due to the increase of the retirees in the system. Uh, if baby boomers retire uh, and start drawing uh, on a full scale their social security and welfare uh, benefits, uh, the U.S. economy may even collapse. Just to put you in the perspective, uh, after 65, uh, you are entitled to about uh, um, $12,000 a year in social security benefits. Uh, about $6,000 a year in uh, Medicare, uh, sorry, Medicaid, 
um, uh, Medicaid program and uh, around thirty thousand uh, dollars in benefits uh, in uh, many uh, Medicare uh, program, uh, which uh, sums up to about thirty thousand dollars a year uh, in uh, health care and uh, social security benefits. So, and if you are living for another 30, 40 years after you retire, um, if you have not contributed to the economy uh, equally during your uh, uh, productive years, you are a net loss to the economy. You probably would agree. There are many discounting mechanisms. We've uh, demonstrated clearly that uh, um, a very marginal increase in life expectancy today will create a net loser on a per capita basis. Um, so uh, what we proposed here to uh, change the situation uh, is basically, so most of the economists that see that, that understand that, and there are lots of economists who project a major financial crisis going forward and pinpoint aging as one of the uh, key factors, they suggest, suggest austerity measures. So that's the uh, new keyword everywhere, austerity. We have to cut the public uh, funding uh, schemes. We need to um, uh, decrease spending. We need to focus on austerity, austerity, austerity. Decrease science funding. That's the worst thing that I can hear, actually, in the uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, but nobody suggests that uh, doing completely the opposite, uh, spending more on, uh, on research on scientific research, accelerating technology, and accelerating aging research. And then uh, going into uh, mass adoption and preventative and regenerative strategies to keep people working and to give them the ability to uh, work longer and to change their mindset, change the retirement culture, uh, to uh, work longer, to contribute to the economy, and to accept the inevitable uh, increases in the retirement age. Uh, and for that to happen, we also need to have lifelong learning, lifelong career planning uh, programs in place uh, that will include uh, mandatory, um, uh, mandatory educational programs for uh, people over time. So currently we have mandatory high school education. Why not have uh, mandatory senior education where after, after 10 or uh, 15 years in labor force, you will have to take additional courses to keep uh, up to speed with your uh, peers uh, and maintain your skill sets. Uh, otherwise, you are not qualifying for uh, social security. Uh, otherwise, we'll have those longevity gains uh, uh, getting to massive austerity measures and everybody will um, suffer. And uh, just to put you in the perspective, there are just recent cases of major economic collapses. Uh, one of them is uh, the history of the Soviet Union. I kind of left part of that. Uh, and uh, the pensioners who lost all of their savings and uh, lost uh, the ability um, to receive funding from the government uh, and major uh, inflation, um, experienced major inflation, they were left on the street. So basically, uh, it's probably one of the reasons uh, for such uh, low life expectancy in Russia today uh, is that uh, during the economic collapse, uh, the Soviet Union, a lot of pensioners lost their, their savings and they couldn't afford uh, any kind of uh, medical benefits and they had to kind of scale down. Um, and many of them perished. There are no books written about the suffering of the pensioners in the Soviet Union. Um, and there are many cases uh, in the history, starting from the uh, Roman Empire, and the best case probably is the Weimar Republic, um, where the economies collapsed uh, due to uh, uh, the redistribution of uh, um, production uh, geographically due to the innovation technology, population growth, and many other factors. Um, so Weimar Republic uh, led to the World War II um, and uh, Hitler coming to power. So they actually, at some point of time, it was cheaper to use uh, paper money uh, to fuel your um, uh, ovens than to use wood. So <coughs> the inflation really destroyed that republic. Uh, and right now, due to the increase in longevity, it could be possible that uh, we will have similar stories. So again, so Soviet Union, nobody kind of uh, imagined, if you're living in a country with uh, 
uh, where you have assumed financial stability, uh, where you have um, uh, where you're comfortable with uh, the current paradigms, you look uh, five years out, maybe 10, 10 years out, and when you're trying to plan for the future, you look at your parents and your peers. You don't really look at uh, uh, other external scenarios. So when people who lived in the Soviet Union, up until the breakdown, they didn't realize that it's coming for them. Uh, and maybe we're standing at the same uh, point as some of the people in the Soviet Union today, and uh, there might be a history of the economic collapse written uh, post-mortem, somewhere in the 2030. Uh, so what can we do to prevent this uh, and to avoid the, uh, the crisis? So everyone in this room can engage in government lobbying uh, and trying to get more funding for aging research and uh, call for a coordinated uh, program similar to the Apollo program uh, for aging research and an extension of the healthy longevity and healthy productive lifespan. So engaging in public advocacy, direct support for aging research, you can donate to uh, uh, foundations like the SENS Foundation, uh, that's the Aubrey de Grace Foundation, the Biogerontology Research Foundation, and there are many other foundations uh, that you may engage with, either as a volunteer or as a donor, um, or you can directly support uh, uh, research. In some cases, uh, you can di get directly involved. I'll tell you about that if, you, uh, if you're not tired yet, uh, how to do that uh, in the next few slides. Uh, you can network. There are Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and other social networks. Uh, and you can lead by example. You can try to focus on uh, extending your own life. I'm also going to talk about that briefly. Um, and postponing your retirement uh, yourself. Um, So I see three scenarios for the next uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, there are many, and many people will have different scenarios for you. Well, one of those scenarios is the global catastrophe. For one reason or another, most likely it's going to be a financial catastrophe where the U.S. will uh, have, will see the U.S. dollar devalued. And since the U.S. is the uh, heart, the beating heart of the world economy, and all the transactions are being cleared in the U.S., that could have uh, major international implications for every one of us. Uh, in, the 2000, in 2009, we've already seen the early birds of that when the Lehman Brothers collapsed. Uh, uh, how many of you are in finance or doing anything related to finance? So you probably remember, uh, you probably remember those times uh, where you're thinking, okay, well, how secure are my money in the form of cash in a certain bank or just in the form of cash, or should they own any physical assets? So many people went, were terrorized by that event and uh, um, withdrew uh, their funds from the economy and tried to buy some physical assets. There could be some uh, bioterror events, there could be epidemics, the natural disasters. Uh, right now, any high school student can produce a virus, theoretically. Uh, you can just you can get uh, all the equipment you need for uh, just $50,000 or uh, even second-hand equipment almost for free uh, and engage in this kind of activity. I'm sure somebody is working on that. Um, uh, and the effect uh, on life expectancy due to that is hard to guess. So every one of you is going to be affected if uh, any of this happens. So again, my bet is on the financial collapse. Um, the second scenario is where uh, despite of the economic slowdown, so we will see that due to the um, uh, very large portion, portion of the population going into the retirement mode, we will see the general economic slowdown, as we see in Japan, for example, over the past 15 years. Um, but the technology uh, gains uh, overall, on the general uh, grand scheme of things, will outpace the increases uh, in welfare burden and social uh, welfare. Uh, and we will see a form of socialism where uh, the government, driven by technology, will be able to support uh, the retired population. Uh, but then, uh, younger population, so everybody, well, maybe 80% of the people in this room will have a chance to live extraordinarily long lives. We're talking about past 150, uh, if the economy doesn't collapse. Just if we let the technologies 
uh, that already exist on the laboratory, preclinical, and clinical level to propagate into the uh, mainstream, you will, every one of you will live much longer lives. But most probably, if in this scenario, older people uh, will not live to the time when those technologies become available. So if you are in your uh, 60s and 70s today, well, there is a very good chance that you are not going to live to those. Um, the third scenario is that if we are actually going to see governments and non-governmental groups uh, take action, uh, accelerate aging research, and uh, coordinate a centralized program to extend the healthy working lifespan, um, and that prevails, and then we will all live extraordinarily long lives, uh, including those in their 60s and 70s today. That can happen within the next 10 years. Uh, one example, if you doubt, uh, uh, doubt me in terms of uh, the potential for lifespan increases, think about apnea. There are lots and lots and lots of examples I can show in technology where uh, um, humans were setting new records everywhere. Do you know what apnea is, right? It's basically uh, the time you can go without breathing. Um, actually, what do you think is the current, uh, is the current world record in uh, apnea? 20 huh? minutes. Yes, 20 minutes. Uh, it's not uh, certified by the uh, um, um, uh, by the apnea uh, association. Uh, but uh, we've seen some of the uh, uh, some of the endurance artists like uh, uh, David um, Blaine. Blaine, yes, uh, going for almost uh, 20 minutes. So he beat, beat the world world record. Uh, and uh, recently there was uh, uh, Gianna Luca. Uh, well, it was a fem feminine name. Uh, from Italy who went for over 20 minutes. Uh, so those records are set uh, every year and technology and uh, new uh, exercises uh, give us the ability to see those records. Uh, if you look at, let's say, 1930s, um, there was a, a very famous uh, pilot and again endurance artist who made a bet that he would be able to dive to 30 meters without uh, breathing, and he won that bet. So that was kind of the father of uh, uh, records in apnea. Well, uh, a couple of years ago, I did 30 meters without a problem. It's just after a, a day of training. So that's how uh, uh, that technology goes. And right now, we see people going to you know 214 meters uh, without uh, special equipment. Well, they need a balloon to uh, emerge afterward and uh, a way to submerge. Uh, so those technologies are uh, progressing and methods for uh, uh, diving deeper and longer are uh, available. So one of the key things that you learn in those courses, in the apnea courses, is that you need to intrinsically believe that when you've got convulsions, you are halfway before you go to the blackout. So if you are intrinsically convinced that you are going to be living longer, you most likely are going to be living longer. Uh, so, uh, current uh, world record for lifespan is 122. Uh, if you want to extrapolate it uh, to yourself, well, think about you being more advanced than that Jean Clement who didn't have running water in her childhood, uh, didn't have antibiotics. Uh, today you have access to all of that and you can utilize some of the novel technologies uh, to live longer. So every one of uh, you may probably live to 150. So one of the ideas that I want to suggest to the audience is to set your perceived life expectancy to 150 and make it competitive. So uh, try to compete with somebody, make a bet that you are going to be living past that age. And most likely your psychology is going to change as well. There is a uh, theory which already has a lot of evidence behind it uh, is the social emotional selectivity theory. If you would like to get into the psychology of aging, that's where you have to start. Uh, it's been proposed by a scientist out of uh, Stanford um, and basically the underlying uh, base of this theory is uh, that you, your behavior changes uh, with 
the length of time you envision you're going to live. So basically, your perceived life expectancy affects your behavior uh, over the course of your life. And if you think that you are going to live, let's say, to 40 or 50, as in so it's the average life expectancy in some countries, like Mozambique, for example, right? Mozambique is a very interesting country to study uh, psychology because, well, first of all, the flag has a star and the Kalashnikov, AK-47, and uh, a stick um, on the flag. Uh, they do have very low life expectancy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in those countries, they make decisions uh, very much like old people. So the decisions are short-term, uh, maximum output today, they do not plan for tomorrow. And um, the shorter your perceived life expectancy is, uh, the more you are going to be acting as an older person. Uh, you are going to have babies early. You are going to have. Uh, uh, um, you are going to try to maximize your utility today versus investing into tomorrow. Uh, but if you actually make it competitive and set the life expectancy to something achievable, again, 150 is probably achievable if uh, uh, a few years ago, well, a couple decades ago, you've seen a person living to 122. With today's advances, you probably can achieve 150. So that's probably achievable. Uh, but something much longer, uh, much further out than your current uh, uh, horizon. So just for example, uh, I'll ask the audience, uh, well, for, for example you, how long do you think you're going to live? Well, before this lecture, your horizon, <laughs> what do you think? 120. Good one. Uh, and, and you, for example? Me? Oh, you, yes. Well, I've got the moment because I'm older than probably most people, I'll probably make it to 90. Okay, anybody else? Give me a number. We'll leave this debate for later, but basically tell me a number. What, what's your perceived? Uh, 80, 90, 80, 90. Okay, perfect. So most of you are making those decisions based on two factors. One factor is uh, your family history. You're looking at genetics of your grandmother and your grandfather, your uh, parents, your, uh, your uh, extended family, uh, and, and you are trying to extrapolate uh, their longevity on yourself. That's one. Second is you look at the population trends in your country. So if you're living in uh, uh, the US, you're probably uh, looking at to live to, let's say, 80. And you're talking to your financial advisor, uh, you're talking to your accountant, you're talking to your lawyer. Uh, when you're making a will, at many, many uh, checkpoints in your life, you are going to be consulting somebody uh, who has a touch with actuarial profession, uh, who are looking at the actuarial uh, tables and making their predictions based on the historic trends. Uh, so that's another um, area where you are drawing your uh, ideas on life expectancy from. Um, but those people are, again, making their decisions on historic trends. If you were to uh, put uh, a Polaroid camera, a large uh, desktop computer, uh, a voice recorder, a toy tape recorder, a uh, music player, a TV, um, and let's say a calculator uh, on the same table, uh, you probably wouldn't consider, and the phone as well, uh, you probably wouldn't uh, envision iPhone, right, just 20 years ago. Uh, so if you're basing uh, your assumptions uh, for the future on historic trends, well, think about things like computers, uh, internet, uh, uh, phones, uh, smartphones, uh, biometrics, so nowadays probably every one of you is using some kind of biometric technology. Well, this watch, for example, can measure non-invasively your pulse, your uh, temperature, uh, the moisture uh, of your body. Uh, many of you probably tried 23andMe uh, genotyping. Some of you are probably taking supplements. So uh, all of that is slowly uh, transpiring and uh, uh, progressing into uh, the general population. So if you are making forecasts based on historic trends, you're already wrong. Even if you are trying to forecast technology 10 years out, uh, you're 
probably going to be wrong. Um, so one of the ideas to think about, I'm not trying to preach here, uh, is to set your perceived life expectancy to 150 and make it competitive. Um, again, think about this and think about uh, this already happening slightly. So maybe you are going to be somewhere here in the worst case. But most likely, if you left 150, there are going to be new technology coming, uh, technologies coming to market further extending your lifespan. And I don't want you to think about infinite lifespans. That's what Aubrey de Grey is trying to uh, propose if sense technologies happen. Um, but there is a potential for you to live extraordinary long lives. Uh, the easiest uh, uh, for most people is to peg their life expectancy to something achievable, uh, something that they can, can comprehend and try to uh, reach in a competitive manner. Of course, if they do that, they are probably going to uh, reach much, lo much longer lifespans. Uh, one of the ideas I recently published in Rejuvenation Research, uh, that's actually already the Grace Journal, uh, is um, personalized science. So I've mentioned uh, the current paradigm of how biomedical breakthroughs get into mainstream use. It takes a very long time, and the first geroprotector uh, you're probably going to see on the market uh, was discovered 40 or more years ago. Um, so to accelerate that in order to be able to use it today, uh, one of the strategies is to get directly involved. Every one of you probably has the potential to uh, manage scientific teams. You don't <coughs> need to be a scientist to be a good manager. Uh, it's good to have both, but uh, from what we've seen, uh, in many cases, uh, you don't need to be a very good scientist to be a good manager to run a biotechnology company or manage a research project. So what we started uh, at our center is uh, something called personalized science, where we get a patient uh, who is at the same time uh, more or less wealthy. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a crook. We're, we're not profiting from that. It's a non-profit initiative. Uh, we're teaching uh, those patients to uh, get involved uh, in their own medical programs, uh, medical uh, problems, um, and try to help them bring a team of scientists and physicians together to try to approach that problem in a goal-oriented manner, uh, where uh, um, a team gathers, looks at the problem from a little bit different perspective than most scientists and medical doctors do, because the current paradigm in uh, uh, medicine and science is that after you finish med school, after you go through your board examination in the US, or let's say you finish the internship uh, and all other certification in other countries, um, as a medical doctor you don't step into the laboratory that often. You usually go to the laboratory just to get maybe diagnostic results. Uh, you don't think about how to solve a problem at the root cause. You think about how to extend patient's life. Uh, and you're not very uh, interested in experimentation. You may be interested in clinical trials, but you don't want to, uh, you're, you're not trying to experiment. Uh, same with scientists. Once you finished your PhD, you got into the lab, you're not working with the patients that much. So what we try to do, we try to foster communication, uh, early communication, basically. Uh, those are young scientists and young physicians working together with a patient. They are educating the patient. They are getting fellowships from the patient, uh, and they are using uh, patients' um, patient-specific uh, samples in their research. So the patient not only donates to research, the, uh, the patient also donates uh, the sample material. Um, so again, we've got a patient who wants to uh, get involved in the, in the research study. He provides a small grant to the research organization. Uh, it's a university or. Uh, um, a non-profit or some other organization uh, provides samples. Uh, a team of young medical doctors and scientists is brought, is brought together. Uh, they consult top experts in the field internationally and produce uh, research reports uh, and uh, high working hypothesis. So that's how you can also directly get involved uh, in um, uh, biomedical sciences and advancing aging research uh, as private individuals. 
So to conclude the presentation, again, on the government level and on the top level, we need to uh, refocus research activities uh, with healthy uh, lifespan in mind. So we need to accelerate aging research and perhaps draw some money uh, that are currently allocated to extending the last mile of the patient's life. So uh, when the patient is already on deathbed and not contributing to the economy, maybe we should fo focus more on extending the healthy productive life. Uh, that's what we really need to convince the governments to do, uh, rather than waste, well, not waste money, but uh, put more money into clinical trials, trying to uh, make people live three, four, ten months longer with metastatic uh, tumors all over the body, uh, maybe we should focus on ways to uh, prevent those tumors from uh, occurring. Um, we need to develop uh, programs for lifelong learning and career planning to ensure that people can be very comfortable uh, with um, working longer and with the new paradigms in uh, uh, retirement. Uh, and perhaps we should consider moving from the retirement plans entirely to disability insurance. So. Uh, some of the pension plans, uh, some of the pension funds we talk to um, are considering doing that. So basically, uh, if you are unable to work, then you get disability insurance and you get so, uh, some welfare. If you are able to work, uh, you continue to work uh, and you get some other perks and benefits uh, to do that. And we really need to uh, make older people uh, who continue to work popular. So make it sexy to work longer. Uh, re reward and recognize those workers. So uh, of course, Soviet Union uh, is not a very good example of any kind of, uh, uh, well, from any view of <laughs> economics. Uh, but uh, they had some interesting ideas to benchmark. So for example, they awarded uh, uh, prizes to people who were working longer. Uh, they uh, encouraged people to work longer and harder. Uh, and uh, that's probably something that we should consider doing in our uh, society. Um, and probably we should consider uh, passing some preventative and regenerative medicine responsibilities to pension funds and insurance companies to uh, encourage healthy behavior and encourage uh, um, a behavior that extends healthy productive lifespans. So that's it for my talk. Uh, and please treat yourself to the book. And I would like to uh, uh, welcome any questions. Well, before we do give out some of the books, we'll have a brief uh, question and answer period. I'd like to start with the first question, Alex. Talking about the war on aging reminds me of the war on cancer that was it, uh, President Nixon launched very publicly in 1971, 42 years ago. So since that time, so much money has indeed been spent on trying to fix cancer, but cancer is still very much with us, and even today, what did you say, 25%, 30% of people still die from cancer. So what is the hope for your war on aging, given that uh, the war on cancer has uh, had so few results so far? Right, so firstly, about the war on cancer. Uh, I think the war on cancer started a little bit, uh, it was a premature, uh, decision to put so much money uh, into something that didn't have a coordinated planned program. Uh, and they immediately jumped into massive clinical trials. Uh, if you want to actually get a very good introduction on history um, of cancer, I encourage you to read the book called uh, The Emperor of All Maladies, or Maladies. Um, by Sikharta Mukharaji, uh, an extremely eloquent uh, uh, and brilliant um, oncologist uh, and cancer researcher, cancer scientist, um, who spent a lot of time at Mass General in Donna Farber, uh, or Mass General and uh, um, a few other top institutions I'll uh, recall, I'll tell you. Uh, yeah, Donna Farber actually. Uh, and he talks about the history of cancer, uh, and when you read this book, you really understand that uh, uh, most of the cancer uh, research started uh, from uh, lengthy um, uh, multi-drug clinical trials. So 
uh, they start with chemotherapy, uh, which kills all cells, but it tries to kill uh, cancer cells first. Um, and the major advances actually came initially in uh, pediatric oncology. In pediatric oncology, by the way, uh, a center where I work, uh, the survival rate is like uh, 88 to 92 percent, depending on uh, cancers. Uh, mostly that's hematologic cancers. Uh, so people go on living more or less healthy lives in most cases. Um, so we can learn from what actually happened in this long war. Yes. So we can see what they did right and what they did wrong and we can structure the war on aging more effectively. Exactly. We need a coordinated program with the healthy lifespan in mind. And uh, the beauty of the war on aging uh, is that there is already a lot of money in going into biomedical research. We're talking about probably $200 billion at least worldwide being spent on biomedical research. Probably it's going to be more. Because uh, what we are tracking is uh, in, through aging portfolio, that's just NIH, uh, European Commission, Australia and Canada, and that's only government funding. A lot of uh, um, biomedical research stays currently in the commercial segment, and we don't even see that because they don't tend not to publish so much. Um, but they spend a lot of money on R&D. So what we really need to do is we re really need to just refocus uh, the research and clinical trials paradigm from extending the last mile, the last uh, uh, few years of the patient, uh, to um, trying to uh, extend healthy, productive lifespan. And there are many ways to uh, structure this, right? There are many <laughs> patterns that you can explore to see what projects you should fund and what projects shouldn't be funded. Uh, and if you are even talking about the war on cancer, the results are already there. Uh, so the incidence rates uh, for many cancers uh, are increasing. Again, due to uh, the changes in our behavior, we eat uh, less healthy food, quote-unquote. Uh, we do not exercise as much. Uh, there is also environmental factors. So uh, the ins and, uh, people are generally living longer. So the incidence of cancer uh, is increasing. But the survival rates are increasing as well. So you see in some cancers, uh, some cancers are curable already. Uh, it's not a uh, sentence, a death sentence is a diagnosis. So uh, if you look at uh, breast cancer, for example, you know, you, can, you already have uh, over 50% survival rates even in you know, uh, less developed countries, less developed centers. Uh, if you're talking about some of the hematologic uh, cancers in kids, we're talking about uh, very extremely high survival rates. If you are talking about uh, testicular cancer, uh, it's all almost uh, it all, all, all links to the uh, um, diagnosis, right? So you can actually, if you diagnose it early, you're going to uh, cure it. Um, and our fundamental understanding of cancer is improving. So uh, the, there is a very large number of targeted compounds reaching the market every year. Currently there are about maybe uh, 150 targeted compounds that are targeting specific molecular pathways uh, in cancer cells um, that have very high efficacy in certain cases. Uh, but they are targeted uh, to specific molecular pathways and uh, most of the oncologists, they don't know how to even prescribe them right now. It's, very, it's more of an art than science. Um, but that area is uh, also growing exponentially and probably in the next 5-10 uh, years, we're going to see uh, very intelligent systems making, making decisions for oncologists. So we're talking about big data. Uh, the more you know about the patient, the more you know about the tumor, uh, the better you can cure it. Uh, you probably have heard about IBM Watson uh, supercomputer. Uh, also think about systems like that, and that's not the only system, there are lots of uh, systems like that, uh, that will help make decisions uh, in cancer, and they're already making you know, decisions in cancer where you can feed a lot of data into Watson. Uh, it uses various uh, algorithms to uh, devise uh, the diagnostic um, pr or procedure. So basically, if it lacks some information, it will ask. But uh, based on the information that it gets, it can make some decisions, even some even better sometimes than uh, uh, trained physicians. 
and then it provides the uh, therapeutic strategy. So in the future, uh, that's going to be uh, one of the roadmaps to uh, curing, uh, curing cancer. For aging, we really need to understand uh, the underlying causes and uh, the damage that uh, um, accumulates during aging uh, and ways uh, to clear it. Uh, and basically, we just need to refocus some of the uh, already existing research projects uh, and research programs uh, to maximize healthy working lifespan at the end. So every dollar invested in biomedical research should be um, coming, so you need to analyze it top down to look at what kind of longevity and healthy longevity dividend it's going to yield before you put it in. Uh, if we uh, relieve the current pipeline from the projects that extend life marginally and in the later years, and put those uh, uh, funds into the projects that extend health and longevity, we're probably not only going to avoid the uh, economic collapse, we're probably going to have a source of unprecedented economic growth. And currently, we do have systems to do it. Uh, if we're talking about war on cancer, we're talking about late 60s, um, where it started, we're talking about Nixon. Uh, the war on aging is probably going to be dramatically different because we, our understanding of the underlying processes <coughs> is so much better. Okay, I saw quite a lot of hands. Uh, uh, Dean. Um, I've got a question on the political dimension of all of this. Um, it strikes me that in some countries, the electorate is increasingly going to be people whose life is considerably longer than it is today. <coughs> that will be reflected in the politicians, and how do you see in different places the political response to what you're predicting? You're absolutely correct. So m well, one of the reasons why we don't have that in place today uh, is because uh, most of the policy makers, they're trying to cater to their electorate. Uh, and uh, most of the policy makers are thinking five years, ten years out, max. They're not thinking about uh, uh, very long time frames. So it would, uh, putting something like that in place would require a very strong political muscle, a very strong political leader, and probably emerging at the time when we're going to see the first signs of economic collapse, where people get scared uh, <coughs> and uh, are much more, um, much less resilient to such dramatic changes. Because but I mean, during times of crisis, people make even more short-term decisions, surely, than they, than they do under normal circumstances. Uh, that's absolutely correct. But when we're talking about, uh, they can either have major austerity measures or this. And uh, at the end of the day, the reason why I'm making those talks and uh, trying to, uh, I'm not a very good public speaker, as you can see, <coughs> but some of those ideas, they are very valuable for policymakers to hear because it gives them an alternative. Uh, versus, uh, instead of cutting some of the public pol some of the public uh, programs, instead of uh, cutting welfare, instead of uh, trying to forcefully uh, cut the retirement age and the benefits to the retirees, they have an alternative strategy, which is focused on boosting uh, aging research, and it's an alternative program. So that's why I want to get it out. So the main alternative to austerity is Keynesian and Keynesian style spending. And some people say let's have a Keynesian style investment in infrastructure or in green energy or alternative energies. And what you're saying is let's have this kind of investment from government focused on longer, healthier living. And that could uh, kick the start of the economy. Absolutely. Uh, question about halfway up there, yes? Yeah, just, just really quickly. Um, so there's a talk on TED by Brian Cox where he's actually talking about the funding of um, how much we spend in the UK, in the US, he talks about the UK spending on science, and then he talks about the income due to people that have a science background and what they've actually contributed to the economy. And it's over 50% over of the GDP is contributed to by the uh, science and you know, people that have done the science, and that, that has led to this amount of GDP. And uh, the amount of funding is uh, is a tiny, tiny, tiny drop on all of further education, higher education, um, uh, research, and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's a very, yeah, that's a very 
clear example that you know, the more you spend on the science, like the more you get, but just ratio, you know, there's a huge, there's a big ratio up that the actual benefit that you, know, you get at the end. Okay, so you're backing up. You're, you're preaching to the priest in this case. <laughs> okay. Uh, because uh, that's exactly what uh, I'm trying to say. That in, you know, in the investment in science, uh, in technology, and specifically uh, focusing on the increase of healthy, productive lifespan, not just general technology. Because uh, general technology is going to yield longer lifespans anyway. But it's going to uh, yield it at the all uh, points of the population uh, curve population distribution, which is probably not great right now. Um, but yes, uh, some of the very small investments uh, in research, let's, th let's think about the Human Genome Project. There are currently uh, several studies uh, looking at the effectiveness and the economic impact of the Human Genome Project. You've probably heard about this project and said, oh, okay, well, they spent uh, uh, a few billion dollars and there is nothing in the clinic today. Uh, but it yielded uh, trillions, we're talking about a trillion dollars or worth of economic benefits um, uh, from the investment in the Human Genome Project. And that was probably you know, around uh, two billion dollars in present money. Um, some of the studies show that a dollar invested in the Human Genome Project uh, resulted in 170 dollars uh, uh, worth of um, uh, GDP um, contribution. Um, there are various ways to discount it. It's not actually a GDP contribution. Basically, it's uh, the benefit to the economy. Not benefit to the economy is uh, uh, 170 plus bucks uh, per dollar invested uh, in present terms. Uh, so it's the best ROI you can get uh, in terms of the public spending is in uh, biomedical sciences. Uh, but even if you refocus that uh, into healthy. Um, productive lifespan gains uh, and try to put some kind of uh, fiscal mechanism where you're trying to evaluate that healthy longevity dividend. That's what we're trying to do. We already uh, figured out how to go from grants to publications to clinical trials to evaluate that uh, uh, the impact of a dollar invested on uh, the clinical trial world. Um, and so on aging portfolio, we definitely know how uh, the link between dollar invested and the grant uh, to uh, public research publications. Uh, if we can go, go further and try to develop a system which tracks uh, this impact over all stages, we probably would be able to advocate to policymakers saying, that, guys, well, here is a system, here is a clear cut uh, uh, way for you to invest the money. Uh, and yes, you can probably advocate uh, to the electorate uh, and explain why you're making this decision and not the other, um, and why you're ma making that today. Uh, please continue. I probably no, no, uh, uh, no, we, we're going to have to take three more questions quickly. Actually, uh, there's one right at the back in that corner, then there's one right at the back in this corner, and then and why, why don't we take the questions all together, and then you can have your answer. And then there's a chat with uh, the beer. And then there's Eva. So let's take these four in a row, please. I just wanted to draw the contradiction. We're saying we're living longer now because uh, the, we become healthier. The investment was in the high, uh, fighting diseases, and now we're longer because we're healthier. You're saying we need to live longer to be healthier. So basically, you're saying we need to change it all dramatically. But in fact, if you just continue researching as we are, we we're going to have longer living, healthier population, exactly as we are targeting now. So I just don't see that the immediate need to change the direction of investment. And the second comment I want to make about uh, your assumptions that the current investment in clinical research is on, pay on a very severe cancer patient. That's basically because of risk-benefit balance. In the very early stages of research, for non-toxic agents, you can research on healthy volunteers. In cancer, you have to go to severe patients to just establish the toxicity profile. And that's why we see so many severe patients involved. But it's not at all target of the research. It just, it's just happening because we need to account for this benefit. So I think those two little um, kind of uh, um, absence of logic, I think, in your assumptions. Well, you could, uh, I, I, that, there, are, there are two Maybe questions. Should... There are two questions, and I'll try to answer them very quickly and yeah. separately. Well, first question is uh, about the general biomedical progress rate and the effect on the economy. 
So yes, you are right. Uh, the biomedical progress rate that we see today is extending both the healthy productive lifespan and lifespan in general. And as a matter of fact, the paper that I have in review for about a year already, it's an economics paper, uh, I didn't talk about that today, <coughs> we created uh, a new model of economic growth based on uh, very established neoclassical economics models uh, on solo and overlapping generations models. Uh, where we look at uh, the biomedical progress rate as, uh, um, uh, as a combination of two rates. One is the uh, rejuvenating uh, biomedical progress rate, and the other one is non-rejuvenating biomedical progress rate. And in our model, uh, the economy grows when the uh, rejuvenating biomedical progress rate is higher than the non-rejuvenating biomedical progress rate. So you can actually look at every research study from this perspective. If you want to uh, evaluate the net uh, present value of your uh, current investment, um, in terms of the healthy uh, productive Is some of that covered in this book, or is it not uh, that, that model is not covered in that book yet. So you have to wait until you publish. Yes, or you can come to the Sense Conference, I'll present I'll the mathematics. The Sense Conference, and also it will be published after that. Uh, yes, so that, that, okay. there's going to be a lot of math. And the uh, second question um, uh, was related to uh, how we engage in clinical trials, right, uh, in terms of cancer. Uh, and when we see patients, uh, 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 we see uh, most of the patients that we see are already terminally ill. Uh, yes, that's correct. But if you look at how companies start clinical trials, the reason why they are trying to focus on uh, those uh, patients that are already terminally ill and on the deathbed is not because uh, there is more money involved there or because it's their research paradigm is because uh, the current uh, system of clinical trials allows you to get faster approval for those clinical trials involving those patients on the deathbed. You show a uh, three, four, five months increase in uh, uh, lifespan uh, compared to the current best method of care, and you, in the US at least, uh, you can get that procedure, the drug covered uh, using your insurance money. The insurance company will cover that. So that paradigm needs to change. Yes, the research, uh, researchers should be looking at the uh, terminally Ill, Ill patients, but when you uh, focus on clinical trials, and that's probably, uh, I would bet that 80% of the research dollars spent today are spent on the clinical trials. Uh, and if we relieve the clinical trials uh, pipeline of the uh, non-healthy uh, longevity uh, dividend yielding projects, we are probably going to have a lot of money to be spent on, health, on increasing healthy productive life and relieve the economy from a very significant investment in late life treatments. If you think about the US, uh, about, um, I think there was a study showing that there is uh, an 80% of the person's uh, lifetime healthcare spending uh, is spent in the last two years of life. So that should change. <laughs> If you are on the deathbed, if you are in the ER room in the US, in the hospital, they will make all those uh, uh, really expensive procedures. They will uh, try to extend your life because they don't want to spoil the statistics in the hospital. Uh, and uh, that's how they also make the money. If you're insured, uh, they are going to be reimbursed for those procedures, and those procedures have a profit margin in them. So. Uh, uh, the current treatment paradigm is also focused on uh, extending the uh, uh, life, but not the healthy, productive life. So it's not just changes in new medicine and new technology. We need, we need changes in the systems and the uh, and that's in the finances. Yes. So Arachelli, you had a question. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask how much are you collaborating or paying attention to the other systems that this would have to be inter interdependent on? Um, and then also, can the money to give people the medicine once it's there because I mean if you're talking about the United States we don't have it we can't just hand it out we don't have the healthcare system the NHS is already suffering um, if you're saying education for the elf, for people that are older great but again that also needs money we barely have an education system for our young people um, also we don't have jobs just flying around 
at the moment that are extra to sustain people living to 150. So what are the ethics behind that? So I think I know the answer to that. The answer is, and has Alex thought holistically and widely about it? I have read the book. He covers a great deal of these questions in the book. Uh, I would encourage uh, most of you to take one away and dip into it. As regards uh, uh, employment when we're older, so yeah, some kinds of jobs aren't suitable for older people, but many, many, many are. And there's a fascinating discussion in there on that as well. Yes. So, I mean, that is a big, that is a big question. That's a big debate, but it uh, takes uh, two chapters to uh, cover just part of so it. So, we can continue some of that discussion, perhaps, uh, online, or some of it in the pub. But I, I said that we'd, I'd give a quick chance to two other people to comment. So, there was you, sorry, and then Eva. You still want to? Yeah? Yeah, I was wondering, uh, with these drastically increased lifespans, how are your thoughts on kind of population growth and resource use? So, is that a worry? Are we going to have too many people on the Earth? Yes, that's not going to be a worry, and in a matter of fact, it's probably going to be completely the opposite. Because if you look at population growth today, most of that occurs in the developing countries, where religion is strong, education, is level, uh, education levels are low, uh, and women just don't have access to anything else to do. Um, so, <laughs> in these other countries. Right, in these other countries. That's why, uh, if, if you see, uh, there is a very strong correlation between uh, uh, female education and uh, birth rates. So uh, birth rates in the US are currently uh, below uh, replenishable levels. So in order for the population to grow, you need 2.2 children per woman. Currently it's already lower in the US, even if, if you look at Taiwan, right? A uh, country uh, which I can talk about for hours, um, uh, they have about 0.9 babies per woman. There for, for many years, because uh, uh, ladies are, uh, well, females are uh, uh, very involved in the labor force, uh, and actually there they contribute to the economy probably just as much as men. In China, in the um, urban population, urban areas, if you're talking about Shanghai, Shenzhen, uh, Guangzhou, Beijing, uh, where people are being groomed from all over China. Uh, uh, you see even lower uh, birth rates per woman. You see maybe 0 .7, 0 0.8 babies per woman. And most of that is by choice. It's not by the government setting. Uh, they already changed the culture, so women are more or less uh, comfortable with not having uh, children, and many of them are involved in labor force. So uh, uh, they are trying to work as much as possible uh, and postpone reproduction. Uh, so provided people can be productive, provided they're mm -hmm. healthy, there isn't a problem with being lots of people in the world. What the problem is, is lots of people are unwell and unhealthy and uh, unproductive. That's the financial problem we should worry about. Absolutely. So uh, basically my theory is that um, technology is growing really fast. Uh, we see a lot of advances in biomedical sciences. So if we do not see a collapse within the next 15-20 uh, years, uh, we are probably going to reach abundance. We're going to see rad radical abundance with technology providing us uh, for um, basically everything. We will probably, every one of us will, is going to become an entertainer. <laughs> uh, one of the alternatives, right? To create content for others to enjoy. Because there is going to be a lot of time for you to spend on uh, this kind of, uh, um, well, on entertainment. Uh, and. Um, the only impediment to this bright future is the possible economic collapse in the short term uh, once the baby boomers uh, reach the retirement mode. And we really need to keep them in the uh, labor force for as long as possible in order for uh, the advances for biomedical sciences and for just culture in general to catch up and to transform the uh, retirement paradigm that we see uh, in the world. And uh, my book was initially actually titled uh, The End of Retirement. The publisher didn't like it. Uh, <laughs> they thought it will not sell very well. So they were we renamed We're all it. looking forward to our retirement, don't we? Most of us don't like our jobs. We obviously have to get in a different situation where more of us are in, in love with our jobs. So if we're doing jobs as entertainers or as researchers, then we might uh, be happy not to retire. Eva? Well, just very briefly, you agreed that to be healthy, you need to eat well, you need to exercise, etc., etc. 
this is basic and this is prevention. So that is tied up with education. We don't need research for it because all the money is really in selling drugs. Uh, the medical establishment is driven by profit and there is no money in prevention. So that's the first point. Point number two, what I've just heard, it seems to me like a little bit of a medicine for the rich. Uh, right, it's a very commonly asked question. Um, initially, yes, it's going to be available to the rich. I'll answer the second part first. Uh, initially, it's probably going to be available to the rich um, and to those uh, small portion of the rich who actually understand and want this. Because even if you talk to Warren Buffett, for example, one of the richest people in the world, uh, he doesn't do any kind of super prevention, right? Go, goes to a hamburger joint for dinner um, uh, and doesn't take many geroprotective drugs, right? So it really requires a certain uh, mindset and intelligence in addition to wealth to uh, pursue some of those innovative uh, procedures because some of them are not available uh, for preventative uh, purposes. So for example, take drugs like metformin. It's an anti-diabetic drug which uh, um, regulates, modulates your glucose levels. Uh, theoretically, it's one of the most powerful and known geroprotective drugs uh, working in many animal models. And theoretically, if you take it in, uh, uh, hypothetically, if you take it in uh, sub-therapeutic doses uh, early in life, it probably will slow down your metabolism a little bit uh, and uh, extend life. Very few people take it. Uh, so it really requires a little bit of personalized research, and that's why we started that personalized science projects, where uh, people get the 360 view on their health, uh, pharmacogenomics, uh, regular diagnostics, uh, maybe full genome uh, sequencing, um, and a personalized team that they can trust to work with. But the discoveries from those personalized medicine projects are going to be in time available to everybody. And if you see uh, like hot running water, uh, it was available only to the rich, you know, a few, uh, well, not a few, uh, let's say a century ago, right? Right now it's available to everybody. So if you're thinking about increase in marginal utility in, for the person or per capita, uh, it's dramatic, right? Right now, even some of the poorest poor in the developed countries, they still have access to some of the benefits, some of the perks that were not available to the Queen of England 200 years ago. Um, so the util uh, some of the uh, advances available to the rich initially are going to be um, in the welfare states like uh, the US and the UK and Europe, they are going to be really rapidly available to uh, the rest of the population. The government makes sure of that. If uh, there is something, if something is proven to work and uh, something is uh, uh, increasing the marginal utility, provides a significant uh, uh, increase in marginal utility, utility per capita, it's going to be available to almost everybody. The government will make sure of that. And some of those technologies, when you take them mainstream, they will become cheap as dirt. Uh, if you mass produce uh, some of the electronics today, right? Let's say an iPhone, it was available to the rich at first. Now everybody carries an iPhone. Um, it's part of the culture, and plus it, becomes, it became cheaper. And the alternatives for the iPhone. But that's nothing to do with the government. The governments don't govern anymore. It's the corporate business, which right, so the it's business the, is driven by profit. It's the two, this is what yes, I see. Sorry, that's the, that's the top-down and bottom-up approach, right? In some cases, there is a demand-driven uh, economy of scale. Mm -hmm. In some cases, it's the government that uh, sets the uh, standards. So for example, for the running water uh, and for the sewage systems, uh, it's available to everybody. It's good for the, it's, it's, it increases the common good. Uh, government invests in that. If you're talking about the healthcare program, <coughs> uh, some of the really top of the line new anti-cancer <coughs> medicine is available to uh, almost everybody, right? While uh, in theory, it costs a lot of money. It's extremely expensive. The iPhone is a good example because although the iPhone was brought out by commercial companies, there's lots of research now that shows that many of the key technologies in the iPhone, such as GPS, such as multi-touch, such as some of the new screens, 
such as the census and so on, they're all possible only because of sustained US government research right. over many decades previously. So that is a combination. There was, gov the government funded many of these technology areas, possibly because of their military implications, and then companies were able to bundle them up for a wider consumer use. I think they'll be the same with many of the medical technologies. They should be funded by government uh, initiatives, and then smaller companies can uh, wrap them up. Right. And on the, on the preventative case, why aren't we spending uh, more on teaching people how to <coughs> eat healthily and exercise? Wouldn't that be more productive than uh, investing in this long-term speculative technology? Right. Well, we actually spend a lot on prevention, but uh, we're doing it in the wrong way. If you look at the National Cancer Institute uh, and the way they spend the money, I think about 10 years ago they realized that spending money on treatment is uh, not as effective on the population level as spending money on prevention. And they set themselves, set themselves a goal to spend about 30% of their money on prevention. Uh, but if you look at how they do it, they do uh, large-scale population studies. They still try to prove that smoking <coughs> causes cancer. Um, so providing marginal uh, preventative strategies that are available to almost everybody uh, to um, uh, get people into more healthy behavior mode. Uh, instead of trying to um, look at drugs uh, that may help uh, prevent uh, damage or repair damage, so such as uh, Aubrey Sands programs, for example. Um, so there's more to prevention than just the, the currently uh, wisdom about healthy eating and healthy yes. eating. So there might be things in our environment we're not aware of which are actually causing these illnesses, if we could research that and see this damage earlier on. Yes, so think about aspirin again, right? Mm -hmm. Right now we see uh, uh, that aspirin in small doses, it doesn't have many toxic effects. Uh, again, it also depends on uh, uh, pers person's individual sensitivity to aspirin, and there are pharmacogenetic tests that can be done uh, to uh, uh, see if it works or not, uh, or if it uh, works in a stronger way or lighter way uh, for a specific person. So the dosage can be calibrated. Some people uh, would actually would not recommend aspirin to some people. So it's individualized. But uh, uh, if you think about it, uh, it has uh, cardioprotective properties and uh, oncoprotective properties, uh, plus anti-inflammatory properties. So, I mean, hey, it's a very straightforward example of something that you can take on a daily level, a daily basis, but they're still very so careful not to get it into prevention um, that uh, you don't see many people taking baby aspirin every day. There, there are many in the later years, but um, uh, very few uh, in their earlier years. Uh, and uh, aspirin is just one example. There are hundreds and hundreds of possible geroprotective compounds that you can take in some of the procedures and some of the early diagnostic uh, procedures that you need to take uh, um, in order to understand uh, your potential risks in the future. So everybody should be tre treated individually and there should be uh, a nationwide uh, inter international programs where uh, there is an individualized approach to uh, prevention. But if you look at the NCI's budget, they are mostly focused on population studies and uh, looking at marginal uh, health benefits of uh, you know, diet and exercise. I see, uh, if you look at uh, the UK, for example, they fund projects like uh, uh, studying 300 Asian families uh, over uh, decades to see if exercise, uh, regular exercise, uh, prevents the onset of uh, metabolic diseases like diabetes, right? Uh, and that's millions of pounds spent. Uh, but at the end of the day, think about it, uh, they're trying to prove that exercise prevents diabetes. Uh, at the end of the day, if it doesn't, what, we shouldn't exercise? Uh, or if it does, okay, we should exercise. Um, and the NCI's budget is full of those projects, right? For example, they're looking at uh, uh, one of my favorite projects was um, uh, levels of literacy in Latin American men with prostate cancer. That's about. Uh, <laughs> so the scope for doing these uh, projects is a bit more smart. Well, basically, imagine not doing if, some of these projects. The outcome of, them. of those of this project is that uh, yes, uh, uh, there is a negative correlation. 
well, then what? You need to uh, educate uh, Latin Americans less? Mm -hmm. uh, or if there is a positive co correlation, okay, we need to actually increase uh, the education levels. Um, so yes, that's, that's a prevention uh, kind of program at the NIH. Another pro project would be, it's a funny one, um, the effect of barber treatment uh, on the cardiovascular health of African-American men. So basically they measure your uh, various cardiovascular biomarkers before you go into a barber shop and afterward and over time. And that's a multi-million dollar project which uh, NIH is actually putting on their banner and advertising. Uh, you can see it in the NIH news. I mean, think about it. Okay, well, you need to go to the barber more often. Um, <laughs> the funny part is that uh, it's actually it's an interesting paradigm everybody should think about. Um, uh, imagine that somebody got a million dollars for a study like that. Uh, what, what, what a scientist does usually? Uh, the scientist brings to get together a few uh, master's students, PhD students, uh, and lets them do the work. And they think that this work is important. And they try to continue on the footsteps of their uh, PhD advisor, for example. And they try to apply for similar grants. And that's how that population uh, demographic studies are evolving. So uh, that is just that's increasing, right? Uh, that area is increasing. Uh, many people are joining this effort um, just because they took part in some of those uh, grant-funded uh, projects. So. Uh, not allowing this project to happen uh, means that you probably would be able to uh, um, save some of the research dollars in the future. 